Hi, my name is Ilias Plagokefalos and I'm an assistant professor of international law here at the University of Utrecht. We'll be spending the next few minutes uh, discussing the basics of international environmental law. First, we're going to go through the main legal instruments and then we're going to run through six basic international principles and uh, obligations of international environmental law. The main legal instruments of international environmental law do not unfortunately contain a general framework agreement for the protection of the environment. There is no also overarching international organization that deals uh, with the protection of the environment. Rather, we have a United Nations Environment Program, or UNEP, with headquarters in uh, Nairobi. Nonetheless, we do have two very important declaratory uh, instruments, that is, non-binding declarations, the 1972 uh, Stockholm Declaration on the Human Environment and the 1992 Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. These two documents contain most of the environmental law principles that are relevant and actually binding on states. Nonetheless, we do have special regimes that target a specific issue area or uh, either in environmental terms or in geographical terms. An example of an issue in uh, environmental terms would be the protection of the oceans or the protection of the polar regions, whereas geographical area would be uh, would would more would uh, involve the protection of a specific region. Now, the main issue areas of international environmental law are the following: have first of all the pollution of the sea, which is mainly regulated by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which contains a part on the protection of the marine environment and very detailed. Uh, regulations and uh, the Convention on Marine Pollution. We have the protection of the atmosphere, which contains uh, the, both the transboundary uh, pollution of the atmosphere, uh, which is regulated by the Convention on Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution, as well as instruments that deal with more specific issues like the protection of the ozone layer or the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. We also have conventional instruments that deal with the protection of international water courses and lakes, as well as polar regions, and finally, instruments that deal with the protection of biological diversity and the protection of species. Roughly, these are the issue areas that international environmental law covers. Now, we're going to go through the six main principles of international environmental law, which also can be seen as, form, as um, obligations uh, for states. The most important one being the obligation to prevent transboundary environmental harm. This is a customary uh, obligation or that all states have. Uh, we know this because it has been reiterated in a series uh, of court decisions, starting with the trail to smelter arbitration, moving to the Corfu Channel case, which is not directly related to environmental law, but uh, nonetheless it contains the basic principle that no state may use its territory in such a way so as to cause harm to another state. We also have the pulp mills case between Argentina and Uruguay, and the most recent case uh, in the International Court of Justice concerning uh, certain activities in the construction of a road between Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Nicaragua and Costa Rica that are also stated that the prevention of transboundary harm is customary law. This is a general obligation to cooperate wherever, whenever, and wherever there is a possibility of causing transboundary harm. Very importantly, this is a due diligence obligation. It means that states must pay attention and be careful when they make an effort uh, to prevent transboundary environmental harm according to international environmental law. This is an obligation of conduct. It means that states will breach their obligation to prevent transboundary environmental harm whenever their conduct in their effort to achieve that is not according to the international legal standards. The most important element of this due diligence obligation is the obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment. And this is also of customary law nature. We know this because the ICJ um, proclaimed so in 2010 in the Pop Mills case. Um, that was repeated by the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, Deep Seabed Disputes Chamber, in its advisory opinion in 2012. And it also uh, forms the basis of a very important convention, the ASPU Convention on Environmental Impact Assessment, that gives us the elements of the impact assessment, the elements that the assessment must contain. 
the 1998 uh, Aarhus Convention on Access to Information ensures that the public will participate in the decision-making process uh, and as well as in the environmental impact assessment process. Besides these two obligations, uh, there are a series of obligations that um, states have and are of customary na uh, law nature uh, pertaining to the prevention of transboundary harm. They have the obligation to notify the state of origin, that is the state where the activity takes place as to notify potentially affected states that it plans to initiate a potentially dangerous for the environment activity. These states must exchange information, consult and negotiate with each other, and every state must have an emergency notification system. This means that every state must have a system in place whereby it will be able to communicate to a potentially affected states every time an accident might take place. After an accident take, takes place, a state has a continuing obligation to mitigate the damage and also monitor the situation thereafter. All of these principles can be found and have been articulated by the International Law Commission of the United Nations in two documents, two sets of documents, the Articles on Prevention 2001 and the Principles on the Allocation of Laws in Case of Transboundary Environmental Harm in 2006. Moving to a fundamental concept of international environmental law, the sustainable development concept. This is an economic concept and it means essentially that when states uh, develop economically, that is when they perform activities, economic activities that might have an impact on the environment, these activities should be um, conducted uh, taking, uh, taking into account their environmental impact. This uh, balancing exercise between the economic rights of states and their obligation to protect the environment. Within that concept, we also find uh, the obligation for this generation to hold the environment in trust for the generations to come. The polluter pays principle is very important. It has also been elaborated by the International Law Commission in the principles on the allocation of laws and essentially means that it is the polluter, the person that pollutes, that must carry the burden of compensating the victims of pollution. To give you an example, uh, when we have oil pollution stemming from a vessel, the ship owner of the vessel is the operator of the activity, hence the polluter, hence he or she has the obligation to pay, provide compensation. States have the obligation to have a legal system in place that allows victims of um, environmental damage to get uh, to have access to prompt and adequate compensation. The precautionary principle uh, is a very important principle, though its value, its normative value, is somewhat debated whether it's custom, whether it's not, whether it's uh, binding or not, and so on and so forth. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, it, it has found its way in numerous uh, conventions uh, on international environmental law and essentially means that states must err on the precaution side even where it is even when there is lack of full scientific certainty of the impacts of the activity in other words when we don't know if an activity might harm the environment we have to take precautionary measures in order to ensure that it will not even we don't know for sure what is going to happen Finally, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities means that not state, not all, all states do not have the same obligations. Developed states have more onerous obligations uh, to protect the environment than, developed, than developing states. This can be seen clearly in uh, the UNFCCC Convention on the Protection of Climate Change, um, where Clearly, the obligations are very different. Uh, developed states have very specific targets to meet, whereas developing states must make an effort to reach uh, goals uh, on climate change, on, the, um, on curbing the greenhouse uh, gas emissions. Thank you very much for your time and attention.